I'm going to thank Stefan Bader and mostly Janet Rothrock for organizing all of this, and they're going to introduce their team to you. But I thought I would begin with two simple comments uh, and introduce our extraordinary speakers. Uh, I, oh, I was asked for a technical thing. There is an, a, a piece of paper, may I borrow this for a nanosecond here? There's a piece of paper going around. Could you put your names and your email address on it so that we can communicate with you without wasting paper and other things and just scoop you emails for anything that's permanent? Now, all the handouts from today will, will be emailed to people. Will be emailed so that oh, you don't, so we don't waste paper. Plus okay. extra information. Plus not extra on the email. Plus <laughs> extra information that's not on the email. <laughs> you can see how well prepped I wasn't, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> When I was 16 years old, my very precocious little brother, who's grown up to be a, a, a famous uh, butterfly expert and birder, uh, Rick Check, came in to me at age 12 and said, Diane, you have to read this book. And it was Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. I, it changed his life, it changed our life. If only people had paid the kind of attention that I'm sure each of you did as you grew up. Um, and what a profound influence it had. I'm reminded, given the newest UN report, of a poem by Mary Oliver, who we lost just recently, you know, and may she rest in the brightest possible light. Mm -hmm. uh, what a remarkable woman. And it's called The Veil. And it seems to me, it's, you will hear, when you hear it, it's very short, but you will hear what I believe the UN report did. There are moments when the veil seems almost to lift, and we understand what the earth is meant to mean to us. The trees in their docility, the hills in their patience, the flowers and the vines in their wild, sweet vitality. With Rachel Carson humming in our ears, and with Mary Oliver, who understood and lived in nature with such elegance and such closeness. Um, let us begin this discussion this morning. I want to thank you all for coming here on this cold morning. I can't think of anything more important than this discussion right now. Um, I want to thank my team. I won't mention them. You all know who you are, but thank you so much. You don't offer, you'll see them all darting around here doing things. And Tammy Gouveia will be coming. She's our third speaker, but she's coming at 10 o'clock because she has office hours at either Chelmsford or Carlisle this morning. So she, she's going to come in, and we'll just drop her into the program wherever, you know, is, you know, when there's a little break after she comes. But her, I meant to get a... a a page of legislation from her, but it's literally hot off the press, and she was not able to give it to me. We were texting last night at 10 o'clock and this morning again, and one reason we'd like to have your email addresses, which Susan will be getting. Susan? Diane <coughs> mentioned it's, it's going around. Right, her. okay. And if, there's a couple seats up here. Well, there's one seat up here. One seat. Yeah, well, for any latecomers um, who aren't here to hear this, please give your information to Susan, and she will send the um, Tammy's page of legislation with links. I think it's really important, if you've never done this before, please uh, I'm, I, knowing this group, you probably have, but if you haven't, it's easy to, to access the, uh, the legislation and then contact your legislators and tell them what you need. And send it to people who are not in this district, because we have such good legislators. Send it to other districts and get your friends in other places in the state to support this legislation. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to... Um, um, give the um, in intro for Gary Clayton, our first speaker. He's the president of Mass Audubon, and he's responsible for the development and implementation of the organization's conservation, education, and advocacy strategies and initiatives to protect the nature of Massachusetts for people and wildlife. It's the largest conservation <coughs> nonprofit in Massachusetts, and it protects 38,000 acres of conservation land and a statewide network of wildlife sanctuaries, nature centers, and museums, which welcome a half million visitors of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds. 
And in full disclosure, I work at Mass Audubon, and there are three teacher naturalists here this morning. Um, as a leader in environmental education in, in New England, Mass Audubon provides programs for about a quarter million children and adults annually, and it continues the strong tradition begun with its founding as the first Audubon organization in the country. And uh, we, uh, Mass Audubon successfully advocates for sound environmental policies at state, uh, local, state, and federal levels. Prior to joining Mass Audubon, Gary held leadership positions at the Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs and the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, um, managing public policy issues related to wetlands, tidelands, coastal waterfront development. Um, a subsequent gubernatorial uh, appointment to the state's Water Resources Commission furthered his role in managing critical natural resources. Uh, he's a resident, a longtime resident of Concord, and has served as a member and chairman of its Natural Resources Commission, Community Preservation Committee, Planning Board, Municipal Light Board, and Select Board, and several advisory task forces. Without further ado, Gary. <laughs> So thank you, Janet. I'm going to stand up here, and I hope for our video videographer that works as well. Let me do a sound check. Can everyone hear me clearly yes. throughout in the back of the room? I'll and raise your hand if that's not always the case for my uh, my brief remarks. So good morning, fellow Concordians and Carlitians as well. Um, it's nice to see you all here. Um, thank you, Janet. Thank you to the League for your invitation. Um, let me say at the outset, I'm <clears throat> um, so appreciative of the work of the League, um, having been a, uh, someone who has interacted with the League off and on over many years. And I, I think as reflected here this morning in terms of the conversation that will take place, the idea and the opportunity for active participation in our democracy is more important than ever. That's not news to any of you, but let me just reinforce, reaffirm for you, for all of us, how important that is. And as you'll see from the, my lapel button, um, we uh, at Mass Audubon enjoyed working with the League of Women Voters uh, this past fall as part of the midterm elections um, in terms of mobilizing our membership base, Mass Audubon's membership base, um, 125,000 members. Um, and as I said to my staff, um, this is a warm up. It's a warm up for 2020. So uh, we've learned a lot, continuing to learn a lot, and we learned a lot in, uh, in collaboration with the League of Women Voters. So let me, um, this morning, uh, with the, the, the time I have available, uh, briefly touch on the issue of climate change. Um, and let me start by, I suppose, maybe posing a question that some of you may have. Mass Audubon, climate change? I thought you guys were all about birds. Uh, and the answer is yes, we are. We love, we love birds. Let me emphasize that um, yes, birds and the nature of Massachusetts. It's an important part of who we are. We look at, think about uh, the protection of habitat and all wildlife species um, for uh, the benefit of people and wildlife. That's an important part of who we are. And our work relative to climate change is something that's evolved over the last 10 or more years as we've begun to look at, study the issues, and really think about what can we as a statewide nature conservation organization do to address this particular issue. Um, and we're working on a number of fronts, whether it be our advocacy work, and as Janet mentioned, uh, Mass Audubon is the first Audubon organization. It's where the Audubon conservation movement started in North America. Our founding mothers in the late 19th century um, were advocates, uh, and uh, I might say very effective advocates in a lot of respects. That's another story for another day. But um, that, that part of our work continues. It's an important part of who we are in terms of our advocacy work, as is our environmental education work. As Janet noted, we have a number of our environmental educators here in the room today. Thank you. Um, our conservation science, our land conservation work now is increasingly directed 
through and focus through our concern and our role as a statewide conservation organization in addressing the challenges of climate change. So I'll speak briefly about that this morning in just a few respects. It will not be all inclusive by any means simply because of the limitations of time. I do want to mention that um, one of my other staff colleagues uh, here this morning, um, Alexandra Vecchio, Alexandria, um, I'm doing a shout out for her because you may have questions later about things I've said or did not say. Um, Alexandra is an important resource and it's an ongoing commitment on the part of Mass Audubon to put staff resources to help us address the issue of climate change. So uh, the, Diane mentioned the, uh, uh, you know, the recent reports, one issued by the United Nations, the other the uh, fourth national climate assessment report. And, <clears throat> You know, the important takeaway on those particular reports, and I think you all understand and appreciate this, is one is a real sense of urgency around this issue of climate change. And I won't go into all the details of this, but, you know, the, the United Nations report, again, continues to point out, indicate the critical nature of this issue that is, you know, global in perspective. Um, and, and one of the important takeaways relative to that is that limiting the warming to 2 degrees centigrade is not sufficient. And that really speaks to the, the question of the need of urgency that we've got to look at what we do both nationally, what we do here within the state, what we do within Concord and Carlisle, and what each of us do individually to respond to the evidence that's before us. And I, I deliberately use the word evidence because <clears throat> sometimes in the conversations about climate change, the, the point is raised, well, do you believe in climate change? I like to turn that question around a little bit and say, how do you perceive, how do you understand and assess the evidence that is before us? And what this most recent um, United Nations report does, again, is make it clear that the evidence is growing um, that, that uh, we are living in the era of rapid climate change or clim climate disruption. The other important um, uh, report that came out, <clears throat> what was it, the day after Thanksgiving? Yes. Interesting how that might have happened. Um, yeah. Also spoke to, again, the, the sense of urgency um, around this particular matter and spoke to you know what a number of the impacts are with the rate of climate change that's underway and particularly looking here in the northeastern United States um, noting that the impacts of climate change are interrelated that um, you know that what is happening is described as really a transformational change to our ecosystems that support wildlife and us um, that it will have impacts on agricultural productivity. Uh, if you live in a low-lying coastal community, you probably, probably already know that the increased rate of uh, sea level rise is already a, a real and direct and immediate threat um, to private property and public resources along the coast. Um, I thought I would share with you one quote um, on the, uh, uh, that related to the the, the UN report, um, Diane quoted Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets. Um, I'm gonna give you another quote. I don't think you'll find it quite as poetic, but um, <laughs> it was a response. It was just, this was published in the Washington Post uh, in October. Uh, and and here's, the, here's the quote, <clears throat> and then I'll let you figure out who might be the person who said this. Um, quote, it was given to me, and I want to look at who drew it. You know, which group drew it. I can give you reports that are fabulous, and I can give you reports that aren't so good. I, I think I see the thought bubbles about over all of your heads. Yeah, I don't sit anymore. That's enough air time for that. Um, so the point is that um, yeah, there we do have, and there is very much a sense of urgency. So now uh, one could look at this and fold your hands up or pull a sheet over your head and just say, you know, woe is me, and it's all despair. Um, yes, it's challenging. Yes, it's of deep concern. And yes, there are things that we can do. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. One of the interesting points I'll mention 
um, in that regard is some of the work that's being done and has been done by the uh, Yale Program for Climate Change Communication. And uh, this is a project at Yale that has routinely continued to poll the public in the United States at least, relative to uh, perceptions, understanding, awareness of climate change matters. In the most recent poll um, that was uh, done and published by the Yale Project um, indicates that, and this is again a national survey, that a large, the finding of that survey was the large majority of Americans say the issue of climate change is in warming is personally important to them and outnumbering those who don't by more than a two to one margin. Now, Perhaps for us in this room today, it's like, well, it's about time. Where, where have you been? Um, but it's really important that, because this is, you know, this, it's a technical issue for us, it's an economic issue, it's a political issue as well. And, um, you know, what we've seen um, over the decades has been, you know, by certain interests, a deliberate effort to confuse, to uh, create a level of uncertainty about the evidence of climate change and what it means uh, for us personally, for our communities and the Commonwealth and beyond. And um, there's an interesting story in the New Yorker magazine published in November by, uh, that you might want to take a look at that speaks to a little bit of the evidence and the story of those particular interests, uh, the fossil fuel industry in particular, and the deliberate actions they took to create confusion and uncertainty in the public's mind about this issue. You know, there's strong, strong parallels to what Big Tobacco did. And um, it's the same, sadly, same story, which is now, of course, being pursued and litigated both by the New York State Attorney General and by Massachusetts Attorney General Maura Healey to dig into, particularly ExxonMobil's, what they knew uh, and what they knew it. Um, as as the, the story in the New Yorker uh, points out, you know, the First Amendment uh, protects your, uh, you know, freedom of speech, and that means you can tell the truth or you can tell lies. Um, but what you can't do, at least in this country, is you can't lie to your shareholders. And that's the, that's the, that's the point of the investigations by both of these attorney generals. Um, so, um, the point is there is growing awareness, there's growing interest, and in, we think about this in terms of political action, that's really important. So let me briefly describe um, this morning uh, some perspectives that I will share with you relative to uh, action that needs and could be taken at the federal level and at the state level, and then my colleague Kate will talk a little bit about what we're doing here locally um, as, what, as well as what we can do individually. And that's an important perspective to keep in mind. You know, you've got to check all the boxes. It's not just one solution here. This is a large, complicated issue. Um, with respect to the federal level, um, I think in a word, the current federal energy and environmental policies are a disaster. I, I, I don't know how else to describe it, and I wish I could be a little more optimistic about that, but when one looks at you know, the fact that uh, the current administration has withdrawn us from the Paris Climate Accord, and understand that that particular agreement, international agreement, wasn't the solution, but it was at least a collective step in the right direction. But we've, as a country at this point, based on the current administration's policies, have stepped away from that. Um, you know, another example uh, that comes to mind when I look at federal energy and environmental policies in this country at the moment is what's happening with respect to the use of our public lands, lands that we all have a uh, ownership in, a right to enjoy and use, um, and particularly now the significant shift and change in policy to extract oil and gas from those public lands. Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, of course, is back in the crosshairs, sadly, in that regard. But closer to home, offshore, uh, you know, there are now, the Department of Interior is moving forward to authorize, you know, the seismic surveys to begin to assess uh, what the potential is for gas and oil development. Um, I've worked, as Janet noted, uh, prior to joining Mass Audubon, uh, in the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, and you know, it's a little bit of a sense of Groundhog Day here. Um, you know, we battled the Reagan administration on this particular matter, 
Um, and we're able, in collaboration with the fishing industry, environmental community, and others, to push back and stop the nonsense uh, associated with uh, pursuing fossil fuel extraction on places like Georgia's Bank. It's just crazy. It's nonsense. All right, that's the, okay. I said you know the, this issue has some level of despair associated with it. You know, one might look at what's happening at the federal level in that regard. Um, there are other things that are going on, and I hope that there will be now increased uh, interest and oversight at the federal level relative to a number of the administration's policies. But let's focus for the moment, in the limited time I have available, let's focus on the state level and the community level, because those, you know, at that level, there's, um, you know, these are interesting laboratories for us right now in terms of looking at, thinking about how to address the issue of climate change. There's some interesting, fascinating work going on, and that's where there's definitely, um, there's energy, there's enthusiasm, and there's hope. And in that regard, let me just mention um, two aspects of that. Here in Massachusetts, there's a lot going on. So I, I, I again, uh, can't go through all the details of some of the actual legislation, proposed legislation, programs, et cetera, both the public sector, non uh, the private sector, and the like. <clears throat> but a couple things to highlight. Um, one, always mindful that you know the cheapest and cleanest source of energy is the energy we don't use. In other words, what we need to do is uh, continue to pursue what has been a very aggressive course of action in Massachusetts, which is to keep pressing, keep moving forward with efforts to jet, to realize high levels of efficiency, the efficient use of energy. Let me uh, speak now to two pieces of legislation, as I say, there's a lots of interesting and compelling ideas that are underway. One that I want to bring to your attention, um, and that is um, a proposal that the Commonwealth will be pursuing in conjunction with a number of other states here in the northeastern United States. Why is that important? Um, it's important because it's intended to focus on the transportation sector. How do we reduce and ultimately eliminate the carbon footprint associated with the uh, transportation sector. In Massachusetts, something on the order of about 43% of our carbon footprint is associated with the transportation sector. I suspect all of us probably, or many of us, drove here this morning as an example. Um, and how we solve that, we've got to solve that question. Um, and, and, and looking at it in a regional context makes a lot of sense for many reasons. One, the northeastern states together represent, if you look at it on a global basis, we're a major emitter of carbon uh, in the northeastern United States. So let's talk about it from Washington, D.C. to Portland, Maine. You know, tens of millions of people, you know, a relatively intensively developed area. Um, and there's an interesting proposal that is now being acted on, and Massachusetts has signed on to explore how together among these northeastern states, including uh, Washington, D.C., how we can develop a program, uh, it's generally described as a cap and invest program, that will um, be directed to reducing the carbon footprint of the transportation sector in this area of the country. Um, why, again, why do that? One, again, because that Transportation sector represents a significant, significant component of our carbon footprint. Number two, this model, this interstate model, is something that we've actually already worked on and put in place. Um, there's a program that was established now, whatever, 10, 12 years ago, uh, again, looking at involving most of the northeastern states, um, and it was designed to work to limit the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from power plants throughout the region. And that model has worked well. We haven't obviously reduced the emissions to zero, but it's very much moving in the right direction. And the idea is to use that same model uh, to apply it to the transportation sector. And it's likely, you know, the idea and the details of this have to be worked out over the next year. But um, the idea is to impose a fee on transportation fuels at the dealer level, not the re retail level, but at the wholesale <coughs> level, and um, use that as a way to begin to create the incentives or disincentives, if you will, 
for us to move, um, again, away from a transportation fleet, uh, public and private, that is you know, very much dependent now on a fossil fuel-based component to uh, a component, uh, energy component that's renewable in its description. Some of the written material is a handout that's available or will be sent to all of you that describes in some detail that particular transportation and climate initiative. It's uh, sometimes referred to as TCI. Um, and uh, again, it's a cap and invest program. So the idea is that the added fee to these fuel charges would then be reinvested in um, public transportation, increased opportunities for energy efficiency and the like. The details of this are to be still worked out. Um, <coughs> But it's, it, it's an interesting idea that's worked for us, as I said, relative to the power plant portion of uh, our energy economy. And it's an idea that politically has worked. But I don't want to leave you with the idea that it's a slam dunk either, um, because with any initiative like this, um, there will be voices and forces that will rise in opposition to it. And, uh, for Mass Audubon, this is going to be one of our legislative priorities in the year ahead to um, work with, monitor what the Baker administration is doing relative to Massachusetts' participation in this collective effort. Um, but we, again, think it has the potential to have a significant positive impact on this issue, but it's all in the details. And um, as a group of activists, I encourage you all to pay very close attention to what is unfolding in that regard. And that's an effort towards mitigating uh, the mitigation of climate change through the reduction of greenhouse gases, the emission of greenhouse gases. The other briefly I want to speak to is um, the efforts relative to adaptation. And what do I mean by adaptation? Um, it's a recognition that, um, you know, for the last century and a half, the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has continued to increase. So even if we were to stop tomorrow, uh, some of the changes by way of climate disruption are already in place and will be uh, at least for the next century. Um, and one of the things we've got to do uh, is um, think about how we adapt, how we will change in light of the changes that are underway and will continue to be underway. Um, Massachusetts passed and was the first state to do so um, legislation last year. It was a Mass Audubon legislative priority relative to uh, climate adaptation. It's a program that is intended, among other things, to work with the municipalities across the state. Concord um, has done so to develop um, vulnerability plans that respond to and address what is some of the inevitable changes. <clears throat> One of the ways that that is going to be funded, you may have heard when the governor released his proposed budget for the next fiscal year, um, is to impose a modest additional fee on real estate transfers. Um, so at the end of the day, programs like this need money if we're going to make the changes that we're seeking. Um, the governor's proposed this as one, one way to do it. Um, maybe there are other ways, but I can assure you that there will be voices uh, that will be raised in strong opposition to this. So again, uh, as an organization that is looking at, thinking about matters of public <coughs> policy at all levels, uh, this is an important one to keep your eye on. Um, we were very, very much involved in very, um, it was a legislative priority for Mass Audubon to help craft and move, develop the coalition that moved this legislation, this climate adaptation legislation, through the Massachusetts legislature. <clears throat> that's happened. That's a significant success. But I will tell you, that's, even though it was a lot of hard work, that was the easy part of the job. And now, as with any legislation, you've got to work to implement it. And we're at that point. How do we pay the bills associated with it? How do we work with communities to get them involved? And I can tell you there's a lot of interest across the state and municipalities relative to this program. Let me wrap up by uh, sharing with you a short video, three and a half minutes, because the idea of climate adaptation can be a little bit abstract as an idea. Um, but let me just give you one perspective on it in terms of what Mass Audubon has done. This is work that we did uh, over the last few years in the town of Plymouth. 
and it uh, was a property that we acquired that had been for a century or more, century and a half, a cranberry farm, a cranberry bog. Um, cranberry growing business in Massachusetts is not where you're gonna make a lot of money these days for a lot of different reasons. But there is a significant number of acres of what had been former wetlands, particularly white cedar swamps, that had been uh, altered over the last couple of centuries in order to facilitate the production of cranberries. Those bogs are now being abandoned. And one of the opportunities we had, and we sort of working in partnership with the town of Plymouth, with state and federal agencies, was to begin a process to restore that bog to a what is a beautiful cold water stream and freshwater wetland. This video gives you just a little bit of a sense of that. It's an adaptation, effort of adaptation to use <clears throat> natural systems, ecosystems, as a way to respond to some of the inevitable changes associated with climate change. It makes, we're looking to have and make the landscape more uh, resilient. So let's take just a few minutes to see this. Audubon has a wonderful program of maintaining sanctuaries. They also have a terrific education program. So I think there was a lot of synergy that made Mass Audubon a more obvious choice for us. Marsh is so special because you have 481 acres of land that have been permanently protected. Here you've got three and a half miles of trails that people can walk on. It's also the largest freshwater restoration in the state of Massachusetts and as far as we know in the Northeast. It's a place where you can really see the story of hope. One of the most exciting parts of restoration is seeing how quickly things return. Uh, plant life, animal species, uh, fisheries, and you get to see that not just immediately but ongoing for the next few years, decades. We have a large diversity of birds here, we have a large diversity of frogs and snakes and reptiles and amphibians, we have a large diversity of insects and plants. There's really something for everyone of, of every age um, and every interest to, to come and do at Tidmarsh. The most exciting thing about Tidmarsh from an educational perspective is being able to bring people to Tidmarsh and provide opportunities for them to observe and experience a landscape in restoration transforming over time. I grew up in a location along a coastline where rapid development was happening and I was also kind of sold this story that once this type of landscape was gone, it was gone forever. So for me, there's also a very exciting message that our education programs can convey about hope, that with the right science, with the right technology, with the right engineering, with the right vision, we can restore these spaces back to their more wild state, more natural state, and it can be a place that's rich in wildlife, ecosystems for people to explore and for people to visit and enjoy. There's been a lot of discussion recently about how nature will help people in the age of climate change, doing things like storing carbon, storing floodwaters, blunting the impact of storm surge. Tidmarsh will do all of those things by restoring three and a half miles of stream channel, reconnecting it to the sea for the first time in 120 years, and creating a much more diverse landscape of habitats. People can get involved at Tidmarsh by going to our website. There you can learn about programs, opportunities to volunteer, how to support our latest projects out here. You can also just come and visit the sanctuary and see our 481 acres, our miles of hiking trails, the birds and wildlife that are out here. And I'd personally like to invite each and every single one of you to come and experience this wonderful place.
So, <clears throat> um, it's an example of adaptation, uh, in this case for us, ecological restoration work. Um, and, uh, you know, the takeaway by way of summary on my part is, yes, we are faced with an urgent, <coughs> urgent critical need. Um, there's work that we can do at all levels, whether it be federal, state, local, and individual. Um, and while there may be moments of despair, as one thinks about and grapples with this issue, uh, don't lose sight of the sense of hope, um, because we can do things and we can make a difference. And this particular project in Plymouth is just one example, again, working together to make a significant change. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I think we're all delighted to see some greenery this morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and to know that in Concord, we passed uh, a resolution <clears throat> at, at town meeting um, with the idea that nature can help us a lot. Oh, you can't hear? Oh, thank you, Gary. <laughs> I'm glad to see the greenery. Okay. Um, there will be three speakers this morning, and after that, there will be a, a question and answer uh, period. We will give a few questions from the league to, to sort of prime the pump and then <coughs> open it up to you. Um, when, I, when I was planning this program in October, I sat down with, a, with several people and, and uh, talked about what I thought might be <coughs> good things to cover and who might be good speakers. And I can tell you that everybody came up with Kate and Gary. <laughs> and then Tammy was gracious enough to come on board and, and say, agree to talk about legislation. She's, um, she has office hours this morning, so she'll be coming in late. Um, Kate is our Director of Sustainability for the Town of Concord. And uh, our town has uh, adopted the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050 in alignment with the Paris Climate Accord and the Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act. In her role, she's responsible for developing and implementing programs, policies, and initiatives to achieve the town's climate and sustainability goals by working with residents, businesses, town departments, committees, community groups, and regional partners. <coughs> Kate spent five years with the Environmental Defense Fund in Boston where she managed EDF, the EDF Climate Corps, which is a network of professionals united to advance climate solutions and is the leading graduate fellowship program in energy and sustainability. She is a part-time adjunct instructor at Clark University teaching sustainable strategy and holds uh, dual degrees from Clark University an MBA and an MS in Environmental Science and Policy. Thank you, Thank Kate. You. Um, thanks for the introduction. Can you all hear me? I'm not naturally very loud, but I will do my very best to project. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, actually, my first week on the job, my first Friday in this role, I came to the first Friday of the League of Women Voters, and it was the best introduction I could get to the town because I was hearing questions and comments and ideas about climate change, and I was really blown away by the level of knowledge and commitment, so I'm really excited to be back. Um, I've been here just a little over a year um, and today I want to talk to you about what we can do in Concord to address climate change but I want to start off by painting a picture of what a sustainable and resilient Concord could look like in the very near future so this morning imagine with me it's 2030 and you wake up in your Concord home and you have a healthy breakfast with some apples from your farm share and it's Monday so you've decided to go meatless and you, it's trash day, so you bring out your trash as always, except you don't really have any trash because now we have curbside composting. So mostly you bring out your curbside composting and you have some recyclables, but not very many because you've decided to quit plastic, so there's not much in there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful day, and so you go back inside, you check your thermostat to make sure the heat's off, but of course it is because everything in your house is super smart and it knows the temperature outside and it's already turned it down. You have a meeting with a friend in Concord Center, so you hop on your bike and you ride along the protected bike lane with your fellow Concordians. You stop and get some water at one of our <laughs> bottle fillers and you park your bike 
just outside Concord Center, um, where there is plethora of bike racks and bike share programs. And you walk into the town center, which is now pedestrian only, there are no cars, and you head to your local coffee shop to meet your friend for coffee. You grab some coffee to go and your reusable mug because you have to head into Boston for a meeting, but first you walk your friend back to the bike rail that is now going to take them back to West Concord as a way to get back and forth without driving because you can't park in the town anyway, only on the periphery because you can only walk. And you get back on your bike and you go to the commuter rail station, but first you drive by some of our solar arrays which now power all of the electricity in town thanks to partnership with Concord Municipal Light Plant. You get there early so you pause and soak up some rays in this nice pocket park near the commuter rail station where you see the permeable pavers which are doing better for infiltration of groundwater and you see some sustainable landscape and you think, hmm, maybe I'll put some of those in my yard. That looks really nice. You hop on the commuter rail, you go into town, the commuter rail runs really frequently so it's really easy to hop in and out. <laughs> 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 Market to pick up your farm share before you head home just in time to pick up your child or grandchild off the electric school bus which emits no pollution and it's nice and quiet and your kid starts on some homework which today is about climate change and biodiversity and while they're doing that you go outside and you get some water from your rain barrel and you go over to your vegetable garden give it a little drink and notice it's doing really well um, and then you're going into town for a meeting on an update on sustainability and on your way you pass a sustainability director driving one of the town's many electric vehicles. <laughs> you park your electric vehicle under a solar canopy in an EV spot where you have to cover all of the town parking lots and you listen to some updates on all the exciting sustainability stuff and how much progress we've made because everyone's doing a really great job and you talk to all sorts of people and give your input on what we should do next. And then you go home and plug in your electric vehicle because charging at night is the cheapest time to charge. And before you go to bed, you hop on Facebook because we still do. And you see, <laughs> and you see that your neighbor just got some new solar panels, so you say congrats and thank you for your commitment to sustainability. And you call it a night. How does that sound? <laughs> So the question is, how do we get there? And the good news is, it's not that hard to imagine that future of a sustainable and resilient Concord, and we know what we need to do to get there. Um, so I want to talk a bit about some solutions. Um, so when we talk about what we can do, we all need to take action on climate together. It's going to involve all of us. I say often that sustainability is a team effort, and it really is. Um, so we talk about reducing our contribution to climate change, sustainability, like Gary mentioned, um, really being conscious of our contribution to the problem, um, but also being prepared for the impacts of climate change that are already happening and we know are going to happen more. Resiliency. Um, what we know we've already seen in Concord is increased average temperatures. We've seen increased number of rainfall events. We've seen increased amount of rainfall during those events, and we know we're going to see more of that going forward. So how can we be better prepared to be resilient to those impacts. And we talk about these together because they really do go hand in hand because the more that we mitigate, the more that we reduce our contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, the less we have to adapt. So I like to show this image on the right because I think it really hits home for what does it feel like when we have climate change. So the Massachusetts shape, the blue one, is where we are now, and that's what summer felt like 1960 to 1999. The black one just below it is what it feels like now in Massachusetts. It feels more like northern New Jersey did during that time period. If we meet our Paris climate goals, it's still going to feel warmer. It's going to feel like Maryland or DC, and if you've ever been there in the summer, you know that feels a lot different than we're used to in New England. And if we do nothing, it could feel like North or South Carolina, which I went to school in North Carolina, and let me tell you, not having air conditioning in the dorm room was very unpleasant. So <laughs> I don't know that we want to get there, but they go hand in hand. The more that we do to mitigate, the less impact that we're going to see going forward. Um, and every action matters, no matter how small it may seem, it really does add up. And there's a lot of things that we can do today, or you can commit to today, to do the next time you can, um, that will really make a difference. So I'm going to talk about 10 things that we can do today. Um, so when we look at our greenhouse gas emissions in Concord, buildings is the biggest portion of that, which I don't think is a surprise to anyone. That's 
how it is pretty much all over the state and the country. So a couple things you can do is look at your own home and get a free home energy assessment. It's free, they'll come in, they'll tell you where you can save energy and money. So it's kind of a no-brainer. If you heat with natural gas, you can go to Mass Save. I have some flyers over there. If you heat with oil or electricity, also free through the light plant. Um, and you can commit to eliminating fossil fuels from your home. And I know this might sound kind of crazy, but it's not. All of us use mostly use natural gas or oil to heat our home. But there's more and more options for using ground source and air source heat pumps that don't use fossil fuels, that just operate on electricity. Right now, um, our Concord Municipal Light Plant is transitioning to 100% carbon-free electricity. So when you make that switch, you're making a really big contribu contribution to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation is another big part. Gary mentioned that it's 40% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. It's the same here in Concord. So obviously you can drive less. Um, we hope that there'll be more options for getting around town and within the area um, not using your car, but we have a lot of great trails. We have a great place for walking and biking. Um, so you can do that where you can um, and drive electric. So driving electric today reduces your greenhouse gas emissions 70%. Driving electric when we have 100% carbon free electricity reduces it 100%. So it is a no brainer. Um, you may not be ready for a new car today or tomorrow or next year, but you can commit to the next car you buy being an electric vehicle. And there are rebates and incentives and more and more models available. And we have plenty more information on that if you want more. Um, waste is a small percentage of our overall emissions, but it's one where we've seen growth over recent years. And the good news is that this is an area where you can really make a difference really easily. You can quit plastic. You know, next time you go and they offer you a plastic straw, don't take one. I have some metal straws if anyone wants one. Um, and you can use reusable mugs. And we've done a lot of work in Concord already with banning plastic bags and water bottles and reducing that plastic. But there's more that we can do. Um, and compost. A lot of our trash overall is organic waste that could be composted. So you could do that at home. There's also a couple companies that will do a curbside pickup. So you just put it out on the curb like you do your trash and they'll pick it up for you and turn it into soil. Water is also a really critical piece of both our emissions and our resilience. Um, we know that we're going to see stresses on our water quality and quantity because of the increases in temperature and the changes to our precipitation patterns. Um, and there's a lot that we can do at home to reduce our demand on the water supply. So like a home energy audit, you can get a home water assessment. And you can find out where your home is using water and ways to reduce that. Um, mostly our water concern is around outdoor watering. So in the summer, Concord's water demand doubles, and that's because of irrigation and watering things outside. Um, so there's a lot you can do to protect, practice sustainable landscaping that will reduce your demand for water outside. Um, we just received a grant from MAPC to do a sustainable landscaping project, so you'll be hearing more and more about that this spring and summer um, with some demonstration gardens to show you what does an alternative to a lawn look like, what do native plants look like, and some best practices for how you can actually do this at home. And lastly, you can amplify the impact by talking to your friends and family. Um, like I said, sustainability is a team effort, and I wish I could talk to all 16,000 people in Concord, but I can't. But you can, because you all have your networks of family and friends. So where you can talk about things that you've done um, and why you care about sustainability, that really can go a long way. Um, and as Gary mentioned, and I'm sure Tammy will tell us as well, you can engage on climate policy. There is a lot going on at the state level, um, in particular, in particular that you can really pay attention to. There are things that we can do in Concord, but the things that happen at the state level are also really important as well. So lastly, this is just my list, and I would just say, as my ask to you, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I post lots of tips and updates and news, and um, if you um, get involved there, you'll see even more of these um, suggestions as we go along. And we also have a website, concordma.gov slash sustainability. I put this list up there with more details and links to how you actually do some of these things. Um, and thank you. <laughs> okay. Um.
Okay. Um, until Tammy comes, we'll be asking, a f the, the league will ask a few questions, and then we'll open it up to you folks to ask all the questions you have. And the last thing I want to say, uh, really, is that I, I constructed this morning hoping that you would come away with a sense of hope and a sense of what you can do. Because I think so often climate change is presented as something that's all doom and gloom. And um, I think anybody that becomes aware of, of the problem um, and has any kind of energy or sense of responsibility cannot help but act. So that's, that's where I come from, and I hope that you do as well. And I think we're preaching to the choir here to, <laughs> to an extent. But uh, as Kate said, we all have family and friends, and they aren't here, and they aren't all as engaged as we are. So I hope that we go out and, and um, help them to act. So, Stefan, you are going to ask the questions from the League to our speakers. And then, um, then after that, Julie, no, we're going to open it up to the public, and Julie will be timing the questions from the public. So, just like Tammy. <laughs> Where's my bell? <laughs> this is simply this is simply because there are so many of you. We'd like as many of you to ask, be able to ask a question as possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and I believe when Representative Govea gets here, we will allow yes. her to make her. Well, yeah, we'll interrupt and, and, and let her get. Why don't you go over there so the people who are in the hall can hear you? And then, oh yeah. And they'll sit out. Use your outdoor voice. <laughs> Outdoor voice. <laughs> so, um, I, one of my personal questions, uh, and I, my personal interest, and I can select from the league lists here, is water and water use. And Kate, you, you touched on that. Um, and so, my follow up question is does the town have a plan to encourage? water conservation by residents. What is in that plan? And I have a follow-on question, but we'll start there with the residents. Then. Yes, so the town is working on deploying, oh, wait, I want me to stand here. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah, built it out. So the town is working on deploying smart water meters to give you more info <coughs> at, as far as how you use water in your home and to encourage conservation by awareness, right? Knowing how much you use. Um, the town is also working with developers and homeowners and businesses um, on the outdoor water use. So looking at um, what kinds of plantings and lawns and the demand for water and outdoor water use. Um, and I imagine you're going to ask what are we doing on town facilities and our goal is to do all of that on, on town facilities. I really believe that the town should be leading by example and doing everything, if not more, than what we're asking everyone else to do. Um, so we'll be doing the same for that as well. Yeah. That's good. And, and the, the last part of the follow-on was what about the schools? And when you say the town, mm -hmm. do you mean to include the schools or mm -hmm. just the municipal properties? Yeah. Test schools included. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And uh, Gary, for you, a, a related question, what impact does water conservation have on improving the environment? And what suggestions would you have for individuals beyond Kate's suggestions? Sure. So the short answer is a great deal. Um, Do you really want to repeat the question for people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. you want me to say it again? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. That Sorry. Um, so what, what impact does water conservation have on improving the environment and what can individuals do to use water more wisely? So uh, again, it, the, it does have a significant impact. Um, think about it just from the perspective of the energy that's required to uh, drill the wells, pump the water, treat the water, um, dispose of the water, because I'd like to think about our water resources in sort of full cycle, if you will. Um, and, you know, we're fortunate to live in Massachusetts, which is a water-rich state, and yet um, it's interesting, and again, my experience on the State Water Resources Commission, you know, I still had to scratch my head when we were reviewing proposals for desalinization plants in eastern Massachusetts. You know, part of that reflects the fact that uh, 
that the population levels are such that there's a demand for water. Secondly, uh, it reflects the fact that we, frankly, in my opinion, still waste a lot of water. Uh, and, and third, um, some of our land use decisions about where we site development and the kind of development um, can lead to the loss or significant impairment of water resources. And we don't have to look very far uh, in this area to see the legacy of some of those decisions that were made decades, even longer ago, relative to uh, land use decisions that adversely affected water supply issues. So uh, there, there's a, you know, there's a cost. Um, again, you know, to have clean, fresh, potable water readily available anytime you turn on the faucet or whatever. Um, yeah, there's there's a cost associated with that. And and one could then get into other issues about uh, you know the need to uh, impound rivers or streams in order to create reservoirs to provide water supply. And there are environmental trade-offs with that. But I think maybe for this morning, it's just to focus on the fact that there's an energy cost associated with the ongoing operation and maintenance of what is obviously an absolutely vital resource for each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I just add one thing? Sure. Um, on our sustainability website, concordma.gov slash sustainability, we have a new video about water conservation um, featuring some of our great staff from the water and sewer division. So definitely check that out. I can play it later if we have time, but I won't. Won't do that at the moment, but okay. definitely check it out. You've got a you've got a number of great little yeah short videos. Short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, back to you, Kate. One more, and then we'll take it. Uh, questions from the audience. Um, the 2018 town survey results show that only three percent of residents consider environment conservation as the highest prior uh, highest priority local issue and lower priority than schools, town character, affordable housing, taxes, public safety, and roads. You wouldn't know it by the group in here this morning, but that's what the 2018 survey said. So the question is, what approach are you taking to raise the awareness of and participation in conservation and environmental initiatives? And I know you touched on some of that before, yeah. but is there anything else you want to add to? Yeah, I mean, it's an it's an ongoing effort and one that um, I think is was is always a challenge in the climate space. Um, I'm encouraged to see more and more people being interested, and I think part of that, sadly, is that we're seeing the impacts of climate change hitting us, and that makes people pay attention. Um, but one of the things I'm doing is like I just encourage all of you to talk to your family and friends, but using other people's networks. You know, a lot of times we are <laughs> preaching to the choir, but there's a lot of ways to get to people through networks that they trust. Um, so one of the things we did through our um, MVP grant, which is the Mass Vulnerability Preparedness Program, that Gary mentioned that the state um, facilitates to help cities and towns address climate change themselves, um, was put together a workshop for partner groups. So organizations that communicate with a large network of people and talk to them about how does climate change impact your constituents and your people? And how do you talk to them about it as part of your messaging? So making sure that all the different voices know how to get to their audiences to really amplify the impact. Um, and then through things like the short videos that we've developed, um, you know, and just reaching people through all sorts of different channels, <coughs> newspaper, online, you know, knowing that people get their information from a lot of different sources, just trying to keep the conversation going um, through all of those channels. If I could, uh, just to add to that, um, uh, as, as someone who actually took the survey, completed the survey uh, last fall. Um, you know, it's always tough sometimes when you're going down the list and having to make that choice of, you know, what's most important. You know, there's a place where I'd like to say all the above. Uh, <laughs> but I, w I would suggest or submit that the, the question about town character, um, you know, that, that's a, that captures a lot about, um, you know, who we are and what we value in this community. And yes, it includes the, you know, the incredible cultural resources of this community, including the historic significance of this town. But it also speaks to protection of open space and, air, you know, issues related to uh, water and air quality and the like. So, I, I you know, I'm... Um, 
You know, I think the town's record on this has been a, actually it's been a strong one. There's more to do. That's not a message for complacence on this, but um, you know, let's let's keep pushing, let's keep pressing ahead. And I agree with Kate. Part of this is is to continue the conversation because one of the things we've learned over the years, um, and I can say, in the case of Mass Audubon on a statewide basis, is you know, how how does one engage in a conversation that that at least over the last ten or twenty years has tended to become more and more polarized. Mm -hmm. And it's you know one of those where you just, uh, let's not raise that because <laughs> we just want to get through the Thanksgiving turkey and move <laughs> on. And, um, but, but you know, we're, we're all learning. And, and we're seeing that the, you know, the, the changes are real, they're happening. Um, let's think about what we can do, not to shame one another, but rather say together we can, in fact, make a difference. And we've got a record of that, not only in this community, but elsewhere as well. Uh, lots to do yet, lots, lots to do. But, but you know, I think we, uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's not a time for despair. It's rather, it's engagement and, and hope. And we do have a, um, there's a resource on the sustainability page called Five Tips for Communicating About Climate Change that kind of walks you through how you might address climate change with any audience. So, um, I just have a quick question. Are you doing an outreach to the Concord schools? Everybody here is quite a bit older. The young people have to get with it in Belgium. The, the school children marched. Is there anything being done to communicate with our schools and what are they doing? Can I, I'll, I'll take Please. a quick, and then, um, Alexander, can I put you on the spot? I remember I mentioned, introduced Alexandra Vecchio, who's a climate change program coordinator at Mass Audubon. And Pam, to your question, at least for Mass Audubon on a statewide basis, in terms of working with schools uh, across the state, the answer is yes. Alexandra? Hi, um, I'm Alexandra, I'm the new climate change program coordinator for Mass Audubon. And so I work in our education department at Mass Audubon, as well as our advocacy department, working closely with our science, communications, and philanthropy departments as well. But the reason I mentioned that I sit in the education department is because that's a lot of the focus of the work we do. Um, so through our states across the Commonwealth, um, we really integrate climate messages into the programs that we offer. Um, one of the programs that I'm most excited about that we're really revving up this year in 2019 is our Youth Climate Summits, uh, which is bringing together right now high school students um, from different regions uh, to come together in one place, um, host a one or two day kind of workshop with learning, teaching, um, resource sharing, uh, and then those students develop climate action plans that then they take back and implement in their communities. So the focus is very much on youth coming up with the plan that they feel best serves their community, their school primarily, um, and then implementing that over the next several months. Um, and so I'm really excited at our Drumlin Farm site right here in uh, Lincoln. Um, we have a semester-long program going on that's drawing students um, from Concord, from Somerville, from Wool, from Boston, all coming together to do a semester-long program focused on climate change and justice um, and the equity issues that come along with climate change. And that's one of five of these Youth Climate Summit programs that we'll have across the Commonwealth, all the way from the Cape and Islands out to Western Massachusetts. So there's lots of examples, but just to say that um, for, for Mass Audubon, education is kind of a, a strong pillar under our climate change work and really is uh, one of the, the areas that we plan to grow the most I see um, moving forward. And I'm happy to take more questions on that after the program. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Janet, so okay. you can do uh, the introductions. And you'll see me again when we get to the general questions from the audience. Wait. I am, I am, um, there, by the way, there are three of us here who are educators at Mass Audubon, who work at Drumlin Farm, and I, in particular, am extremely delighted that Mass Audubon is getting more involved now with older children, because so often I think public school systems think of uh, um, the, the group that we cater to being about this tall. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think we have an awful lot to offer, and maybe our focus should be on the older kids. And um, I, I dropped in at the, the summit the other day that they were having, and um, I'm 
very energized to, to watch that. <laughs> okay. So, Tammy, um, yes. hope you took a deep breath. If you want to get a cup of coffee, you have about a minute here. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, Tammy Gouveia is our newly minted state representative from the 14th Middlesex di uh, District. Um, she brings to Massachusetts legislature her expertise in public health social work, her skills as a strategic thinker and collaborator, passion for social and environmental justice, and a commitment to helping others achieve their fullest potential. Um, she's conducted environmental policy research and spearheaded several public health initiatives, bringing people from various backgrounds together to implement policies and programs to prevent, I mean, to promote <laughs> adolescent, health, adolescent health and wellness, substance abuse prevention, childhood lead poisoning prevention. Uh, she was the executive director of Tobacco Free Mass and founded the Massachusetts chapter for the Women's March on Washington. She graduated from Mount Holyoke with a major in politics and a minor in women's studies and received both her Master's of Social Work and Master's of Public Health uh, from Boston University, where she's currently studying opioid policies for a doctorate in public health. In addition to her work as a state rep, uh, Tammy also serves as a consultant at the Ripple Foundation, which seeks to improve population health and fundamentally design how we deliver care. She was born and raised in Lowell, Massachusetts, and now lives in Acton. Great. Can you guys hear me out there? I think if you stand yeah. over yeah. there, yeah. 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 yeah, it just it helps okay. a little bit. I will do that. <laughs> All right. I can see Hi. <laughs> this is amazing. I had a feeling we were at capacity when I couldn't find parking. So amazing. Nope, not at all. No whoops. This is great. Um, down. Down. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so I'm sorry to miss the beginning and the opening remarks. I'm sure some of this stuff might have already been covered. Hopefully what I share with you here is going to be helpful, and I look forward to the dialogue. Uh, we are, I'm, I'm really just newly minted, as you said, I don't even feel completely hatched. Um, there, we're in the middle of the co-sponsorship period right now. We have two weeks for co-sponsorship. Right after we got sworn in, we had two weeks to file bills. So far, there have been 6,140 bills filed. <laughs> that will not be the end of it. There will be late files. There will be home rule petitions. There'll be other things that will come up, so we will easily bump up to the 7,000, which is pretty typical in a legislative session. I did quick subject searches just to get a sense of how many bills were related to climate. This is a very crude way of doing a search. It's not how you would do a typical like diving in to really get a sense, but it gives you a quick overview. There were 83 that came up with the word climate, 65 solar, 40 wind, 62 electric vehicle, and 289 related to energy. And I didn't go too far, I just kind of kept it kind of tight in the way that I was thinking about various climate policies that we're probably pretty interested in. You'll notice I didn't search for carbon, those do come up under climate pretty easily. Um, and co-sponsorship ends today at 4.59 p.m. So, Here's a quick rundown. I will share these slides. I will put in hyperlinks and I will continue to add bills because we're literally in the middle of co-sponsorship right now. Emily is working, adding my name to a whole bunch of bills. I've been continuing to research. I keep getting flood, flooded with requests to sign on to bills. So this list will continue to grow, no doubt about it. Um, but just to give you a quick sense, I have signed on to both the Barrett and the Benson carbon pricing bills. I do have some concerns about the Barrett bill, which I've talked to him about, I've talked to some constituents about, but I did sign on to it. Uh, repowering Mass with 100% renewable energy, that's the one that Senator Eldridge and Pacheco uh, filed last year, Marjorie Decker and Sean Garbley filed it on the House side this year. In transportation, there are a number of bills to modernize and make a more sustainable uh, transportation system. Um, the last three were filed by my dear friend John Hecht, who's really pushing on trying to get more electric vehicles out and get more support for electric vehicles. So I've signed on to all three of those. These, I've, I've co-sponsored all of these. One bill I filed, um, the MCAN reached out to me. I filed a bill establishing a stretch energy code. If you know anything about the building code, you know that it does not include net zero. So we have filed a piece of legislation that's pretty, um, 
uh, robust to try to get us at the local level to have buildings um, incorporate in uh, the stretch energy code as part of the uh, Green Communities Act. And then solar and wind, removing barriers to solar for low-income communities. There's a number of solar bills. I haven't been able to vet them all yet. That's my task for the rest of this afternoon to make sure that I'm signing on to the bills that I think we all care about in this room. And many, many more. So I was asked to talk a little bit about effective outreach methods and effective lobbying. And I'm going to start with the things not to do um, in this sponsorship period. Don't send me a tweet. It's really hard for me to track that. Then I have to take what's on my phone and then go to my computer and look up the bill. So don't tweet it to me. Don't send me a Facebook message. Don't send me a Facebook message through Messenger. And don't text it to me. The easiest way to let your elected officials know that you care about a bill is to email them or call them. It just really streamlines the process because I'm not looking at my phone all the time for Facebook messages, for tweets, and for messages. I'm really looking to my email and my phone to understand what people care about. The other thing, office hours. So I've had, that's where I just came from, and Chumsford was office hours. I've had four, three or four office hours. Climate is a really big focus of those conversations. I can tell you that every time I have office hours, we talk about bold climate change policies. Um, so that's a really good way to have a conversation with others who are like-minded, others who care about this issue and also learn about some other issues as well. And then lobby days. So you'll see some, you'll recognize some folks here <laughs> um, who came in for lobby day. And we had a really great conversation, both about the Barrett bill, but also about a whole slew of uh, policies that people are really paying attention to and that people really care about. Um, those will be added to my list of bills that I co-sponsor. Other opportunities to weigh in, because I don't want you to just think that this is like your moment and that's it. Definitely during the co-sponsorship period, definitely at hearings, and I will be posting those on my website. I will tweet them out. I will you know, try to get the word out as much as possible about when hearings are happening. You probably noticed during the rules debate that some of us were trying to increase transparency to give you even more time to be able to know what's coming and to be able to weigh in that didn't happen. And we can talk about that if you have questions about it. But um, so those of us who are really pushing on transparency are going to do our best to get the information out to you in as timely a manner as possible and as, through as many avenues as possible so that you can weigh in on hearings. But if you miss a hearing, don't fret. You can still submit a letter of testimony in support or in opposition to a bill. So don't feel like your hearing is your only opportunity. Letters to the editor and letters to the committee chairs. If you need help navigating the website, you can reach out to me or to Emily and we can help you find who are the committee chairs. Because um, it, it is on the Massachusetts website or it will be once committee assignments are made. We think probably next week is when those assignments will happen. Letters to the editor is a really great way to get the message out. malegislature.gov is the, is the main website, the main URL. And then during the budgeting process, which happens in the spring, is also another opportunity for us to put in things that are related to climate change or other bills or issues that you care about. Always make phone calls and send emails. Um, and I'm going to show you what I'm doing to track the outreach that you make to me in my office um, so you can see how it's informing the decisions I'm making about bills that I'm going to sponsor and what that means. And then you don't have to thank me, but if you, you know, you've been trying to hound somebody else about supporting a bill or speaking out in support of a bill, thank them. Thank them on social media um, and thank them in person um, and thank them in an email. So how I'm doing my homework, I, since getting elected, well, first even through the primary, but then certainly through the general, have been in conversation with a lot of you and in conversation with a lot of uh, advocacy groups who live this work every single day and have been really digging into the details of various pieces of legislation. So a week and a half ago, we had um, an environment and climate fair at the State House where all the different environmental and climate advocacy organizations came and so that we as elected officials could walk around and understand what were the various bills. This is the only topic that I've seen where a fair like this happened and I can tell you there's well over a couple hundred bills that I was taking a look at as a result of this and having really great conversations with 
all kinds of advocates from Mass Audubon, Mass Audubon to Sierra Club, um, you know, really ran the gamut of the kinds of issues that we were talking about. But ultimately, really where my decision making comes in, and I'm sorry you really can't see this, but when you get the PowerPoint slides, you can look at it. This is how we're tracking your phone calls and your emails and any outreach that you make to us. We have about 200 individual um, calls or requests, and you can see it really runs the gamut. Um, some of this came up during the rules debate earlier this week. There were You can tell when there's an action alert that goes out because all of a sudden it's call after call after call about the same topic. But they are different people who are calling. The thing that's really, really helpful is if you can get the docket number. So bills at the beginning have an HD for docket. It's not a bill number. It's just the way the process starts. So first it's an HD, and then after it gets assigned to a committee, it will change to an HB house bill. So please, if you reach out to your elected officials, try to know the house bill or the house docket number if you're calling the state representative. If you're calling the state senator, know what the Senate version of that bill is. Sometimes people will reach out to us and say, we want you to sign on to the House version of Senator Barrett's bill. There is no House version of Senator Barrett's bill because Senator Barrett's bill is not the same as Representative Benson's bill. So just keep that in mind. As much information as you can provide, the numbers will be really helpful. If you give us just a title, it's really hard to find and make sure that we know exactly what bill you're talking about. There are two different bills called SAVE. One of them is about nursing, and the other one is about school education around violence. If you just call up and say save and don't give me a number, I don't know which one you really care about if you don't give more details. So as much detail as you can give will be more effective in helping us be effective in following up and helping you uh, get support for the bill that you care about. Um, to see my legislation, this is um, the official state website, uh, my section of it. There's the side that says sponsored. So those are ones that I filed myself and asked for others to sign on to or co-file with me. And then on the right side are co-sponsored. So you'll see the slew of probably 250 or so bills that I'm signing on as a co-sponsor. And I've been really judicious about what I'm signing on to because I'm not going to sign on to a bill and not work it. If I sign on to a bill, I will do my best to show up at the hearing. I will certainly submit a letter of testimony. I will talk to advocates. I will make sure that we're, I'm doing all I can to help move that bill forward. Um, so that's one way that you can find out in a very quick way what's happening. But we're going to put even more up on my website. Um, so that you can sort of really get a running list because they don't put a whole lot on our own individual pages up at the State House. And then I'm tweeting out. So this is um, all of my tweets from formal session on Wednesday, the votes that I took uh, to vote off of the speaker in support of transparency and some rules reform. So I will continue to do that. If you have ideas of things that would be helpful to get the word out to you, please let me know. We're just sort of experimenting with what might be the most effective to get the word out. And then what's encouraging to me? So we have the green team. So uh, that's Representative Tommy Vitolo and Representative Michelle Socolo on the right, um, who are part of the green team with me. And there are 14 or 15 other uh, newly elected officials coming in who are part of this green team saying that we're going to stand for bold climate change policies. And then on the left-hand side is an article that I just read, and then some of the lead sponsors of the House version of the Senator Eldridge, Senator Pacheco bill. And what's interesting about this story is last session, there were only four co-sponsors of their bill. There are 30 this year. Mm -hmm. So what's encouraging is that this is part of the conversation up at the State House all the time now. So just rest assured that people are talking about it. I think it will be in the... The devils will be in the details of what actually happens. Um, and it's, you know, climate is partly why some of us were standing for greater transparency so we can get bills out so that we can hear them because we know that time is of the essence and things are really urgent right now. But that is encouraging to me to see the level of support um, increasing in just one session. And that's it for me. Stay here so the folks can yeah. see me. Yeah.
So, um, if anybody in the back has questions, just stand up and I'll tell Stefan. So, um, before you came or as you came in, we had a couple of questions for our first two speakers, and I have one question for you on a topic that you didn't cover. Okay. And that is um, <laughs> gas leaks. Oh, they yes. continue to prol proliferate and appear not to be a priority for the gas companies to fix. Right. So what is the legislature doing to address this and specifically change the laws so the gas companies have an incentive to fix the leaks? Oh, that I'd have to look at. I know there is legislation uh, that was filed to address the gas leaks. Anybody know off the top of their heads? I know I would be signing on to it because I've been in conversation with mothers out front. They came to my office hours last week. We had a conversation about, you know, the fact that I will be supporting the bills that they're really pushing on. I firmly believe that we should not be paying for those gas leaks, um, that it's the responsibility of the utility companies to be covering those costs. Um, part of it is because they need to let some, some of the gas leak out, is my understanding, because of physics. But at the same time, there are some, some areas where the leaks are so large and um, of such an urgent nature and they're not being addressed. So I want to hold uh, utility companies accountable for those gas leaks and what they're doing to our environment as a result of those leaks. <laughs> but I don't know the specific legislation. I will make sure I add it to the PowerPoint and I'll put gas leaks as a separate uh, bolded title so you know what those pieces of legislation are. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So at this point, we're going to Alan, did you throw it out to open to the public to ask some questions. And, uh, sir? How are you? Hi, oh, and how are you? I'm slacking your first month, huh? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm Alan Woodward. I was chair of Tobacco Free Mass when um, Tammy was our executive director. And uh, I will tell you, she's a dynamo, if, if you can tell already. At any rate, um, the comment was earlier today that 43% of our carbon footprint, in essence fossil fuel use, is transportation. And we heard something about some of the efforts that are being made. But in Norway now, nearly a third of the vehicles are electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. It's not complex. They keep the cost of gas up at $8 a gallon, even though they're one of the biggest producers. And there's no tax on electric cars. Okay. So finally they make the economics <clears throat> such that the adoption is very rapid. Yeah. I think one of the things that's obviously incented the huge vehicles that we're seeing is that gas prices have gone down. Mm -hmm. I think we ought to figure out how gas price, gasoline prices goes up 10% 10, <laughs> 10 every single year so people can anticipate. Between the taxes and whatever yeah. else, it goes up 10% a year and at the same time there should be no tax yeah. on electric vehicles. And I think we can replicate what's going on in Europe and ex expedite the, trans the transformation significantly. Yeah, I, I agree and thank you for raising that. Um, one of the bills that I would have filed but there was already somebody who filed it is also in the meantime to because that's going to be a little bit of a heavier political lift, even if you're phasing it in. And I appreciate the phasing in so people can anticipate it, like you said. Um, but one of the bills is to allow a local option for a gas tax increase, because there are some communities who know that locally, politically, it would be fine to increase the, the, tax, the tax on gas. Um, but they're also in a position where financially their community can bear that burden um, differently than another community um, that might not be able to bear that burden in the same way. Because that's the tension with the gas taxes, um, envi environmental justice communities, and making sure that it's not overburdening lower income populations. So this local option would be uh, a way for municipalities to raise um, some revenue while also contributing to um, you know, climate in, in, a, in a positive direction. But I will um, see if there's a bill like that that phases it in like you suggested. Okay, uh, Terry, next question. Yes, um, I'm Terry Ackerman. I have a quick question for Kate and a question for Gary. Um, Kate, can you just talk a little bit more about how we might construct that link between our two train stations? Mm -hmm. Nicholas and your, um, how do you visualize that? And um, Gary, you were talking, uh, or in the video, about landscaping being more resilient in terms of uh, preventing storm surge and storing carbon, et cetera. Can you just say more about that? Sure. Do you want 
Kate. Yeah, I have no idea. I just think, <laughs> <laughs> to be completely honest, um, I, I just think that, you know, there's a lot of interest in how do we get within yeah. town without yeah. driving, um, and whether it's a combination of bike lanes or some kind of new technology like that, I just like to see some more options in the next, you know, 10 years that enable us to get around town, right. which a lot of times, a lot of us are just going around town, right? And you right. do you need to get in your car to do that. Um, and so whether what that might look like, I'm not sure, but oh, I hope that I see more. Oh, no, no, I wish. I wish I did. I, but I think Alice does. Okay. And Brian <laughs> Brian's <laughs> waving his hand back there. So I just want to say that the MBTA does have a solution, and they know how to do it through an electric vehicle that runs on the rails and can go um, fairly quickly back and forth between stations. They've been investigating it along, along the Green Line, no, along the commuter rail, uh, Framingham line between Newton and maybe the New Balance outlet, the New Balance news station, to have an interrail use of the rail system. I don't know wow. anything more than that, but I know that that's possible. They're looking at it and it's electric. Wow. Okay. Um, I'm going to call on people, Wait, Garrett next, you then you, Brian, and Wait, then who are, Oh, I'm sorry, Garrett. I'm, yeah, so Terry had a question. So um, briefly, uh, relative to uh, the example I shared to some of our conservation work in building, creating, sustaining uh, resilient landscapes. Um, and there are a number of ways that that can happen. Um, I shared with you our, our work in Plymouth, and we're doing that work and supporting, there's a state agency called the Division of Ecological Restoration. And in fact, they provided some important technical assistance for us with the project in Plymouth. And a number of the steps that are being taken um, involve removing dams, uh, adjusting street culverts, um, and uh, removing invasive species and the like. So there are things that we're actually well aware of and we're gaining more experience in terms of how to do these in a more hopefully cost-effective way. One of the interesting things that we, uh, we, and I'm saying this is the collective, we uh, look at and think about these kinds of issues that we uh, had to work with the state regulatory agencies on is um, to modify the state wetland protection regulations because a lot of this work to create and sustain more resilient landscapes involves manipulating areas that are wetlands and floodplains. Mm -hmm. In my former role, um, you know, we worked to create a regulatory structure that attempted to provide a high level of protection for the protection of wetlands and floodplains. Mm -hmm. But he actually, we needed to modify that and adjust it to provide the flexibility to um, to do this. So in Western, I'll give you just one quick more one more quick example. In Western Massachusetts, uh, we own property, Mass Audubon owns property. It's within the Housatonic River Valley, um, and there was a dam that had been constructed in the early 20th century on this beautiful freshwater, cold water stream that flows from October Mountain to the river. Uh, the dam served no useful purpose for us, so we decided it was time to remove that. It took us two, two and a half years to work through the regulatory process. The, the contractor uh, came on site and literally, without exaggeration, within two days, the cold water stream was once flowing again. So that's one of the changes, you know, and the Commonwealth's been open and receptive to that, but that's part of the, you know, within the, the regulatory environment, we have to make some adjustments that allow, promote, and facilitate those kinds of outcomes. Thank you. Garrett. Um, yeah, my name's Garrett Whitney, and this is an invitation, not a question, though you're invited too. Um, uh, this coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock, in Canantum at the home of C.C. King and Tom Tarpey. Mm -hmm. uh, C.C. and Tom and I are going to co-sponsor a, a live stream presentation from the Sunrise Movement on the Green New Deal, which most of you have probably heard of. Uh, I could say about that very briefly, the Green New Deal is, is the only, I think, proposal legislatively ever to actually do what the UN said we need to do in totality. There are lots of good ways, you know, Lots of good initiatives, and thousands of them. You've heard so many t today that I can't keep track. We need to do th all of those and a lot more. This Green New Deal proposal is to actually, again, do what the UN said, which is to cut our carbon emissions in half by 2030 and eliminate them completely globally by 2050. That sounds impossible, and it is yeah. if we use the, the usual thinking. 
So the Sunrise Movement, uh, thank you, has, um, has actually proposed a plan and a process and has a strategy to get this to happen in this country. And we think this country is a, obviously a major, a major piece for the globe. Uh, so this will be a live stream Tuesday, 7 o'clock. Uh, it needs sign-ups. So the way to sign up is to go to Sunrise Movement. Karen, I'm going to s include that in the message that we emailed Great. to everybody. Okay, so okay. Su okay. thank you. Yeah. Sunrisemovement.org. And if you all come, you won't fit. We hope that you all try to come. And then when you go to sign up, discover that there's another one in Acton, and there's another one in Wayland. And if you want to si start another one here, you can do that too, right on the same web page. So thank you, Tuesday, 7 o'clock. Thank you to CC and Tom. Thank you. Thank you. Here in case anybody wants to have a flyer. So you can pick up the flyers with more information on your way out of the building. I'll come back to you in a second. I said. Um, so to Brian, next. To follow up on the, on the question that was asked about moving people around town, uh, there is an idea being explored as a local resident who is looking to grant some money to do some kind of program in town to help those under 65 move around town. Uh, so. What about like the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> This room, uh, the COA um, has their shuttle buses. Um, but if you're if you don't qualify to use those, those that facility, uh, then you're you're pretty much left on to your own devices. Uh, the Crosstown Connect has in Acton the, the CAT, which is their busing. Uh, Lexington since 1976 has had their Lex Express uh, busing service. Right. Uh, doing that in a uh, with a, with a plug-in vehicle or something that is uh, low emissions to allow those shuttle buses to move around Concord to help people uh, of all ages uh, be able to get from place to place. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Uh, George Johnston, we uh, had the pleasure of moving perhaps from the reddest state in the country, South Carolina, to the reddest state in the country. Massachusetts. And I'm surprised sitting here today that the people think I didn't hear that I was expecting I had really nothing to contribute. And uh, one of the issues uh, in, involves the, uh, the question of uh, a, uh, what we used to call in South Carolina a rural and critical lands board. Mm -hmm. Every year in the South Carolina budget, there is a budget item for the purchase of rural and critical lands. And there is a board that selects from a group of properties. I was a member of that board. And we sat, we deliberated, and we went to the owners, and we negotiated. And we collected, tremendously successful, to the point where we're now wondering how we're going to maintain all these properties. <laughs> <laughs> but still, we protected some beautifully, beautiful sites. And uh, does Massachusetts have such a sort of fundamental program? And the second quick point is on communication. The best communicator, and we found it in South Carolina, is what's on your desk. People signed on to what we call and viral exec, where you don't have to go into a website with all sorts of nits, nits and crannies. You get a message from people like you or you or whomever saying, pay attention to X, Y, Z, whatever. It's coming up, pay attention to it. You come and there's an administrator. So if you're not using that vehicle, you're missing out on a great mass communication <laughs> so, so to your second point, a lot of advocacy groups do that. You just need to sign on to their list and they'll send you an email blast when things are coming yeah, but it's up. It's too complicated. There's too many of them. Well, I'm not sure how what you're describing people would find that, out about. That's you know, something Richard. done by the state, in other words. That was a state sanctioned board. No, no, I run it. No, I'm talking no. about his second point, it's, though. Oh, the second, yeah, the second, yeah. Yeah, yeah on yeah. communication, it's, I mean, you have to have a mechanism for people signing up for that. Right there on the desk. 
Well, right. that's what I'm saying. So different groups have their have their list. So I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah. So so um, for Mass Audubon, um, we actually have an opportunity if you wish to sign up. Uh, Give us your email. Every week we have a quick uh, email description of what is going on in terms of Beacon Hill by way of key pieces of legislation or important actions pending before the executive branch. Um, it's short, it's quick, it's intended to be actionable, and um, uh, you know it costs you nothing. You don't have to be a member of Mass Audubon to, to sign up for it, and Alexandra has a uh, sign up sheet if you wish to do that. Um, I think it's helpful because as the state representative indicated, there's gonna be approximately 7,000 bills filed in this legislative session. So I have staff on Beacon Hill who review every one of those. And then we work in partnership with members of the legislature. We work with other environmental organizations to focus in on what's happening, what's moving, what do we need to stop, et cetera. On your first question relative to land conservation, um, the, the, the cultural history of Massachusetts and New England, England is a little bit different, of course, than some of the other states. Um, and by that, I mean that a lot of, there's a high level of interest in land conservation in New England, and I'll say specifically in Massachusetts, it's reflected in the fact that we have the largest number of private land trusts in the country are concentrated here in Massachusetts. The Concord Land Conservation Trust is an example of that private nonprofit group that's looking very carefully, closely at land protection opportunities. The town of Concord does that as well within the framework of a, a master, you know, an overall master plan. The funding support for those kinds of acquisition efforts uh, can be dollars locally raised, local tax dollars, community preservation funds, local gifts, and at the state level, the state has been a critical partner in land conservation, and so one of the things that we watch for is to see what the governor is proposing in the budget relative to the support of land conservation efforts, whether it be for public water supply, wildlife habitat, farm land preservation, park lands, et cetera. So it's there, it happens, just in a, in a different way than may have happened on a more county or region-wide basis, perhaps, in, in South Carolina. I can talk to you more about it afterwards. Jay, what, what's up? We, we, okay. we could put that on our handout, Alexandra. If you could talk to Susan Fry, make sure that link is available to people on the handout. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay. Jay? Jonathan Kyes. Yeah. Uh, we talked about the transportation area the major contributor problem. But we talk about electric cars. What are the electric utilities? They're going to have to produce that electricity. So what's that impact? I don't care who answers the question. <laughs> yeah. But locally, I think Kate may have the answer. Yeah, I mean, electric vehicles and electrification of heating and cooling is part of the life cycle. Sorry, I'm not loud. Um, <laughs> electric vehicles and electrifying um, heating and cooling is part of the light plan strategic plan. And they are very much considering that question, right? If we are looking at a future that is all electric, that means more electricity, right? Um, so they're looking at figuring out how to do that through more generation and battery storage and new technologies. I think that we'll also see as we become more efficient in how we use energy, you know, that will start to kind of balance out. We're not talking about just adding to load. We'll also be reducing through efficiency efforts. And I did want to mention that um, Concord Municipal Light Plant does have two rebate programs for electric vehicles. So um, that's something that's available if folks are interested in driving electric. Uh, I know that, that that question comes up. Um, and can the grid handle like the different load? Mm -hmm. So that is part of the conversation. I think the bigger the, the bigger piece to highlight in what you just said too is the energy storage aspects and the, right. the way that the technology is changing and making sure that we're leveraging that technology when it comes to policies that we're passing up at the state house. Mm -hmm. okay. And the other thing I would add to it quickly is as we think about alternative energy resources being developed in this region, you know, one of the most abundant and available is offshore wind. And while that's had a, a bumpy start here in Massachusetts with the proposed Cape Wind project, um, one of the things that's happening now is that the technology to utilize and develop offshore wind is moving at a point where it can be established in much more uh, deeper waters, that is farther offshore. Um, so one of the things 
I, I said there wasn't much happening that I saw positive on the federal level relative to policy initiatives. The one thing that's happening is that there's an ongoing effort to promote and develop off significant offshore wind energy resources. And so there are projects underway now that um, in combination with the state's requirement for utilities to purchase that uh, electricity that it's, you know, we're shifting uh, the source from fossil fuel base to wind, for example, but I agree with Tammy that the other part of the, the calculus here is, is storage. It becomes an important part of the equation. So you capture and make the electricity while the sun shines, but what do you do at night? You've got to have a capacity to store it. And there are some interesting ways to get about it, both centralized and in a decentralized fashion. <coughs> Okay, Bob Andrews, finally your turn. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a question for Kate. Um, if, if, as part of your, you know, your video showing the sustainable future of concrete, <laughs> you showed one of those green collection barrels, you know, for organic waste. And I, my question is, are there any plans underway on the part of the town of Concord to pick up organic waste on, on soon or in the foreseeable future. Uh, and a related comment is that uh, you know, reduction of food waste is, is clearly uh, an important action mm -hmm. for climate. You know, uh, and it's uh, going to be discussed in a sustainable concrete coffee on composting uh, in uh, April. And I uh, hope that uh, a number of people here may take that in. This is the other uh, <laughs> early morning thing in Concord. <laughs> Third Tuesday, every month. 7.30. 7.30 a.m. At, at the Harvey Wheeler Center. www.concord.org to find the uh, details. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure of any plans to do curbside composting at this point, but I think that forum would be a great time to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Laurie. <laughs> <laughs> um, good, good morning. Thank you all for very uh, interesting and inspiring uh, presentations and discussion of bills that we can talk about. As I see it, things are interconnected. And so although most of the effort or the, uh, the focus of this meeting has been on energy, I think uh, Gary in particular ha has mentioned nature as a big part of the solution. And um, one thing I see is that um, you know, nature and, and wiser land management, not just on conservation lands, but across the state, every level of property is part of the solution, both in terms of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, which is so critical, but also preparing our communities to deal with the negative impacts of intense storms. So I, I was wondering if anyone could expand upon that. I wonder, do you want to speak about the MVP plan for Concord? That's Pardon? Yeah, I mean, Lori knows and others do too that we've participated in the first step of the state's MVP process, which is to bring together a group of people to identify what are we most vulnerable to in Concord as it relates to climate change and identify some actions that we could start to take to make ourselves more resilient to those changes. Um, the state also has MVP action grants, which are more funds to actually do some of that work. Um, they have not yet rolled out this next round of action grants, but when they do, we plan to apply for some projects under that. One of the projects that I mentioned briefly is um, a grant that we got from MAPC to look at sustainable landscaping. And the idea there is that there are these nature-based solutions to reducing our impact on climate change and being prepared for the impacts that we're seeing. Um, so that project is one way that we'll be working on that um, going forward and hopefully we'll be able to get some additional funds to do some specific projects, but there's a lot we can do. And I would just say that, again, some of the work that Mass Audubon has been doing across the state, because we own and manage over 38,000 acres of land and, and we look at those, those acres, yes, they're protected, natural reserves. They're also outdoor laboratories, so it gives us an opportunity to 
test some ideas. The example in Plymouth that I shared with you is very much about that. Um, and we're looking what we can do in partnership with others because this issue is bigger than any one of us or any individual organization or public entity. Um, you know, we're, you know we're, we're working, California has been doing some interesting things. So we actually have worked with the state of California to essentially um, preserve cell carbon credits on about 10,000 acres of our woodland. And it's one more tool to sort of help address this larger issue. Um, so, and, and we, have a, we have a consulting service within Mass Audubon that takes the information we gain from the work and our own experience and share it with municipalities across the state. So we're working at it at different levels. And again, I would say we've got to keep looking at experimenting with different approaches and always think about what we can do in partnership with, as, as ways to address this. Thank you. I'm glad you brought this up. Um, there's a couple bills that I'm co-sponsoring and taking a look at, um, and I might get it wrong, but it's CPACE, which uh, is a way to support the property owners from being able to you know, install more energy efficient uh, components. So I just learned about it yesterday. So I'm, I'm gonna be taking a look at that. I don't know if anybody has more information on that one. And then the healthy soil um, bill is really, really important. Just been learning a lot about how we farm in the state, not that we have tons and tons of farming, but how we farm and even just how we manage our soils to make sure that they're healthy to uh, capture the carbon. So I did sign on to that. Um, back to the gentleman's point earlier, George, um, about forest preservation. There is a, a new bill to look at forest preservation. I think it does create some sort of board or commission, particularly for Western Mass. They're really concerned about about this. Um, and then there was also another bill that uh, Representative Dykema uh, filed on drought management that I've signed on to as well. And really just protecting our waters like our rivers um, from uh, uh, overgrowth of species and learning a little bit about that. But then also just like uh, the fact that uh, human excrement is in our water and how dangerous that is and what does it mean for the fact that that ultimately becomes our drinking water. So really taking a look at all of those as they relate to climate because I see the interrelationships between a, a lot of things as well. So thank you. For More oh. questions. I'll, I'll take this lady first, then you, Tanya, next. Uh, Kathy Johnston, uh, one, one of the problems I see with the promotion of electric cars is the infrastructure to go along with it, the receptacles needed um, for charging. And that's one thing if you're in your own home, but quite something different if you live in a, in a condo building or apartment building. And I spoke with a person who appeared on the last electric bill about electric cars, and I had a nice conversation with him. And he, um, he said that the state of Massachusetts has now approved the ability for any person, even in a condominium or apartment building, to um, to have a um, right receptacle installed yeah. mm -hmm. at their own expense, probably, unless they can work out something with the building, mm -hmm. um, as long as it's safe and whatever. <coughs> and um, what he was saying is that the state of California has approved it for the entire state. And he said that they're hoping that Massachusetts will approve the same thing. And I wondered how, if that in fact is coming along. That was filed. It's called Right to Charge. Um, and so uh, there are actually, I think, two different bills. Um, because, and this might be a touchy subject in historic Concord, but also the right to charge in historic districts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> also files, just saying. Um, to Lori's point that every building and every person and every household could be contributing to climate, so sometimes it bumps up against other interests um, and priorities. Um, and then the other bill is just a general right to charge. I think it doesn't necessarily address um, the concerns that get raised in historic districts and what that means. But that bill has been filed, and I will be signing on to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, Tanya has a question, then I'll come back to you. Yeah, um, it's a question, uh, a comment to follow up with uh, Lori's point that I, I don't think we should um, limit our work towards natural preservation uh, to just uh, putting aside parcels of conservation land or forest, we should actually be looking into preserving 
natural resources and actual neighborhoods to just just for the benefit of all and for connectivity. And um, uh, also recently I heard a new discussion about the offshore winds between some Rhode Island fishermen and the, I think the CEO of the Alamo. And I was disappointed um, about the, uh, I, I, think, I think that business interests are dominating the discussion too much. And that may be partly why nature-based solutions are getting shortchanged. I, I'll mm -hmm. just put it just briefly and bluntly like that. And mm -hmm. stop it. Uh, yeah. I'm just uh, it up. Um, so the first point about the need to think about the connectivity of protected open spaces, um, that small open spaces, green spaces are also very important, particularly uh, in more densely populated areas. I've lived for many, many years in West Concord and I understand and appreciate the, the importance and the value of those kinds of protected open spaces. And I think, um, you know, again, in Massachusetts, because there's a, historically been a strong interest in land protection. Um, and again, at the town level and the land trust level, private land trust, they become really important players in addressing those neighborhood related uh, green space issues and needs. And then in terms of offshore wind, um, you, you know, you're right, they're you know, part of the concern that's been raised by the expansion, proposed expansion of offshore wind projects is the conflict with commercial fishing operations. And, um, you know, what we've got to strive for, uh, it, first, I guess, is to recognize that any energy system, green, renewable, fossil, whatever label you want to fix to it, it has an impact. You know, there's an impact on the environment. There can be impact on human uh, uh, communities, et cetera. And I think the challenge for all of us is, is as consumers of electricity, um, how do we manage that? How do we procure the electricity that we utilize in a way that's most environmentally sound? Again, to my earlier remark, the, most, the cleanest, the most efficient source of energy is to use it most efficiently. That is not to use it when you don't necessarily need to. Um, we are, as we look at, this is speaking for Mass Audubon, as we look at offshore wind development, um, you know, we remain very actively involved. We're participating actively in the federal, because these are federal offshore lands that we're talking about, uh, in that process in terms of where to site these facilities, how to site them, and um, you know, there are issues regarding potential impact on right whale, northern right whale populations, which are mm -hmm. critically endangered. There's issues about potential conflicts with commercial fisheries. Uh, I'm of, of a, a view that, that we need to keep the lines of communication open, keep working at looking at ways to reduce, minimize, or avoid those impacts. Mm -hmm. But when I weigh the opportunity associated with generating electricity from uh, you know, a significant wind resource compared to, you know, an oil-fired power plant or a gas-fired power plant, you know, got to put that, you know, in, in, put that into perspective in terms of what the trade-offs are. Or, I mean, I know you mentioned coal. We've kind of largely eliminated coal-fired power plants in this part of the world, but we're still affected by coal-fired power plants in the Midwest. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. And, you know, if you travel to West Virginia, you see the consequences of that activity, and they're horrific, you know, both on the land and on the people that live there. So that's, that's the healthy tension that exists. And so not to minimize the concerns about potential impacts offshore, at the moment, I think those, if carefully thought through, can be managed in a way that minimizes, maybe not completely avoids, some of the environmental impacts. But weigh that against the other alternatives at this point in time. Perfect. I don't need to. Okay. <laughs> I think we have time for one or maybe two more questions. And let me take somebody I haven't called yet, and then I'll give you the last shot. Okay? How's that? Thanks. Sir. My name is Kim Slack. Uh, I want to thank all of you. You're very extremely knowledgeable about all these issues. Particularly Tammy, you just come into the legislature. I, I don't know how you ran up. With <laughs> <laughs> I do a month in a day. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> One fast. <laughs> I want to destroy another kind of uh, vision that uh, might Kate might add into this. Um, 
uh, some communities in the state have been experimenting with, um, in addition to um, de redesigning uh, trucks that pick up garbage. So in addition to taking recycling, they can take organic waste. Hamilton is an example of this. And they then take that organic waste to a compost site, either near the, um, you know, in the town, or um, there's actually, the state has designed an anaerobic digester that's near a recycling plant up near uh, Andover. So you can truck the same thing, and part of the issue with organic waste is you know, you can hire um, like Black Earth and one of these companies that will come to your house and pick this up, but the um, greenhouse gas emissions yeah. of, of mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. having trucks go around right. or community uh, separate trucks come around and do that. So I wonder if we could have uh, either, oh, oh and then one other piece of this is that a lot of communities and the state has provided um, grants for anaerobic digestion in connection with sewage treatment. Sewage treatment takes an enormous amount of energy. We certainly don't want to foul our Concord River or streams around, but um, we could actually take some of that energy that we use for that. So um, uh, I wonder if including into our vision is some way of um, you know, getting some grant money from the state to look at um, adding anaerobic digestion next to our sewage treatment plant. Thank you. It's a great idea, and I love grant money, so. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> I. I would just mention very quickly, in terms of um, uh, one of our facilities in Boston, the Boston Nature Center in Mattapan, a portion of that property has historically served as the leaf composting facility for the city of Boston. We're now talking with some private developers about the opportunity to establish an anaerobic digestion facility that would handle both food waste and leaf matter. Um, obviously, the outputs from that process are methane gas. Um, the reason they're interested in this particular site near on you know, our property, this corner of our property, which is, as I said, used for composting, is that uh, National Grid has a gas pipeline that goes right next to it. So they've already talked to National Grid about <coughs> pumping the methane directly into that pipeline. And then the finished product, the physical finished product, um, is compostable material. So whether this all works or not, it has to get through a City of Boston review process. But we're interested in exploring and looking at the idea. Again, it's, it might, it's a pilot because there's nothing else like it yet on the East Coast. Um, and that a part of our mission as an organization is, well, can we work with, help promote these kinds of ideas and see how it works for, in this case, the City of Boston. Stay, yeah, stay that's tuned. That's a great um, property, by the way. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't been there, it's in Mattapan. It's fabulous. It's great. Okay, I, I said I'd come back to Lori. Lori, you're the last one. Make it real quick. I just want to apologize again to the folks in the overflow that we couldn't get everyone in here, but um, thank you for coming anyway. And so, Lori, thank last you. question. Thank you. <laughs> um, I just want to point out, I, I learned yesterday that there is a bill uh, that's on the docket. I can't give you the number, uh, but I did post it on the Conquer Can Facebook page, and I'd be more than glad to share it with anyone who would like it. Uh, it is a compilation of bills, including the soil bill that uh, Kate mentioned and others. And <coughs> This important uh, bill is something that I think deserves all of our support, and that is, um, it's a pesticide bill, oh, yeah. which gives communities the option to restrict mm -hmm. or prohibit the use of pesticides in their towns. Now, why is that important? It's important right now because Massachusetts, as a state, uh, does not allow that. So even if your Board of Health were to say, these pesticides are hazards. Um, we know that, um, you know, they are, yeah. and they're causing a lot of harm. We have the neonics with the bees and the, the populations. We have glyphosates that have been declared uh, carcinogens. carcinogens, probable carcinogens by the World Health mm -hmm. Organization and recognized in, in California. So. We ought to be able to protect ourselves. We ought to be able to protect our wildlife. 
Um, so this is a critical bill, and I would I would ask everyone to call Timmy's office. It's already on it. If you need help, we will be glad to give it to you. Thank I've you. I sponsored that one. There's also another one. By, so that the one you're referring to is filed by Dylan Fernandez, and it's uh, docket number 291. There's also one filed by Representative Gentile, Carmen Gentile, uh, which would ban pesticides in all schools. So you can't use it. So that would be like a nice companion to yes. municipalities having the right to say you can't use blah, blah, blah. But to say it's an outright, you can't use it on any school property would be, I think, an even better step in the right direction. And I did sign in to Neonix as well. So. Carmen Gentile is from our neighboring town of Sudbury. Yes. So with thank that, I'll you. turn it back over to yeah. Janet. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, we did not print everything that is on that board. Um, Gary sent this, which is the top center piece over there, and it talks about the TCI, the Transportation and Climate Initiative, that he talked about. So all of these things, uh, well, there, there are a great number of documents that we can send to you, but you need to make sure that you either signed on uh, your email address on that sheet that we passed around, or that you see Susan Fry at the door there. Um, I think we have contact information for Tammy. You put that up on your one of the slides. And do, do, are you contactable at ConcordMA.gov? Mm -hmm. You just get on. Um, that's on the online list also. Okay, that's on. And so. do we have a contact either for Alexandra or Gary or somebody no, um, if, if people wanted to sign up? Yeah, I can share it. Yeah, I'll, okay. I'll get it on the email. Okay, so Alexandra will make that available. Um, the video of this presentation should be available in a week or so. Um, it's always, um, you know, a work in progress, but we hope to have it up in a week. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Go, go forth. Go forth with hope and energy. <laughs>